Welcome, my friends. Professional comic book nerd and sexy vampire of the internet, Josh here, from Panels to Pixels. Watch freely of your own will, and leave some of the happiness you bring. When comic book YouTuber extraordinaire Matt Draper told me he was orchestrating a huge horror collaboration called One Horrifying Moment, I said, you can count me in. You can find the full playlist for this big Halloween crossover linked at the end of this video, or in the description below, and it includes contributions from a whole host of your favourite creators. And I don't know about all those other more talented, more successful, and more attractive YouTubers, but I had a really hard time deciding what movie, video game, TV show, or comic book I was going to talk about for this series. Right off the bat, I knew I wanted something I could sink my teeth into, but I was careful not to bite off more than I could chew. The stakes were high, but we all have our crosses to bear. And then it bit me, and I knew I would be heading in the right direction. And that's why I'm here to talk about 2005's The Ginger Dead Man, starring Gary Busey. No, not really, I fooled you with my vampiric mind powers. This is one horrifying moment, and this is Bram Stoker's Dracula, the comic book. When Bram Stoker first introduced his tale of a night-dwelling, neck-chomping Transylvanian count back in 1897, I wonder if he knew just how long his vampiric creation would outlive him. The lasting appeal of Dracula proves, if nothing else, that vampires really are immortal, and nowhere is this more evident than in the character's far-reaching cinematic legacy. Be it Max Schreck in Nosferatu, Bela Lugosi in 1931's Dracula, or Christopher Lee in Hammer's The Horror of Dracula, there have been more than 200 feature film adaptations of Stoker's gothic horror novel, but 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, is the only one to bear the name of the Irish author. So, it must be the most accurate, right? Well, not exactly. Famously parodied in an episode of The Simpsons, this version of Dracula is a visually stylish interpretation from the legendary director behind the Godfather trilogy and Apocalypse Now. In many ways, the film is rigidly faithful to its source material, with lines of dialogue lifted directly from the novel, but it differs fundamentally in that Gary Oldman's Count has now become the romantic hero of the story. For me, this takes some of the bite out of the mysterious monster depicted in Stoker's book. Oldman's tragic antagonist is a somewhat defanged Lord of Darkness, more Lothario than Lucifer. In addition to this, the movie sought to blur the lines between fact and fiction by basing Dracula's origin on that of real-world historical figure Vlad Tepes, aka Vlad the Impaler. Screenwriter James V. Hart wasn't the first to speculate that the infamous blood-drinking Wallachian prince may have been an inspiration behind Stoker's Count, but this film was the first to bring these parallels to the forefront, turning them into the central conceit of the story. All of these decisions appear to have been an attempt by the filmmakers to ground this gothic fantasy with a sense of realism. And you know what we say about realism around here. As Coppola explained at the time of the film's release, we are aware that many elements commonly used in Victorian storytelling are perceived by modern audiences as camp, so we will be taking a more modern approach to what is shocking. Sure, because God forbid a story about a cloaked aristocrat who engages in moonlit fits of homoerotic bloodlust should be camp. As it stands, Coppola's Dracula is at times an incongruous mess of giallo-esque cinematography, 90s action flick tropes, period drama waffling, and some scarily bad English accents. I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. In spite of all this, 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula remains a modern horror classic. The film was a box office smash, and with that came tie-in video games, pinball machines, and oh look, a comic book. Bram Stoker's Dracula was a four-issue comic book adaptation of the movie published by Topps Comics. The Topps Company, best known as purveyors of trading cards and bubblegum, announced the formation of Topps Comics in 1992, seeking to ride the wave of the short-lived comics boom of the 1990s. Specialising in licensed titles based on movies and TV shows, Topps published such tie-in titles as The X-Files, Jurassic Park and Mars Attacks, as well as some cult classic original series such as Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, and their Kirbyverse line, which was based on concepts by the then-retired Jack Kirby. But the first series to fly forth from the presses of this fledgling comic book company, a baptism of blood, if you will, was Bram Stoker's Dracula, written by Roy Thomas, with art by Mike Mignola. Here occurs the shocking and frightening history of the wild berserker, Prince Dracula, how he impaled people and roasted them, 
boiled their heads in a kettle, how he skinned them alive and hacked them to pieces, and then drank their blood. In 1462, Vlad Dracula leads a victory against the Turks, but returns to his home of Wallachia to find his wife dead. A priest informs him that she has committed suicide after his enemies falsely reported his death, and as such her soul will be damned to hell. Enraged, Dracula renounces Christ and swears his revenge. Four centuries later, fresh face solicitor Jonathan Harker travels to rural Transylvania to arrange the real estate acquisitions of a reclusive nobleman, his host, Count Dracula. After discovering a photograph of Jonathan's fiancée Mina, whom he believes to be the reincarnation of his wife, Elizabetha, the demonic Count torments the young lawyer before leaving for London. Harker is left a prisoner in Dracula's decrepit castle, a mere plaything at the carnal mercies of the Count's wicked brides. In London, Dracula feeds upon Mina's friend and closest confidant, Lucy, whose deteriorating health and behavioural changes lead her doctor and former suitor to summon Dr. Abraham Van Helsing. The good doctor recognises that Lucy has become the victim of a vampire. Dracula, appearing young and rejuvenated, meets Mina on the streets of London and attempts to woo her, but is foiled when she receives word from Jonathan that he has escaped the castle. As Mina travels to Romania to be reunited with her betrothed, a furious Dracula turns Lucy into a full-blown bloodsucker. Her suitors, aided by Van Helsing, are left with no choice but to kill poor Lucy. A moment's courage and it is done. Take the stake in your left hand, place the point over her heart and strike. Back in London, Jonathan meets with Van Helsing and the others as they launch a plan to drive the Count away. Heading to Dracula's new home of Carfax Abbey, they destroy the boxes of Transylvanian soil to which the vampire is tethered. Dracula visits Mina, who is now fully under the vampire's spell. She now remembers her previous life as Elizabetha and wishes to be made undead beside the Count. God forgive me. I love you. I want to be what you are. See what you see. Love what you love. Mina, to walk with me, you must die to your breathing life and be reborn to mine. I give you life eternal, everlasting love, the power of the storm and the beasts of the earth. Walk with me to be my loving wife forever. Yes, I... I will. Yes. I will take you as my eternal bride, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. Drink and join me in eternal life. Suddenly, the hunters burst into the bedroom, causing Dracula to flee, but not before claiming Mina as his bride. As Mina transforms into a neck-gnawing Nosferatu, Van Helsing hypnotizes her and learns of Dracula's movements via the vampire's psychic bond. The posse track the Count back to his Transylvanian castle, and a fight ensues between the hunters and Dracula's gypsy helpers. Dracula emerges from his coffin, but Jonathan slices his throat, and the vampire king is stabbed in the heart. Mina rushes to the wounded Count's aid, and Van Helsing allows them to retreat into the chapel, where, almost 400 years ago, Dracula renounced God. As the vampire lies dying in an ancient demonic form, he and Mina share true love's kiss. Dracula is transformed into his younger self, and begs Mina to give him peace. As Mina thrusts the knife through his heart, the vampire curse is lifted. Prince Dracula and Elizabetha are reunited in eternity. Writer Roy Thomas was no stranger to the world of vampire comics, having penned several stories in Marvel titles like Dracula Lives and Vampire Tales. Not to mention that he co-created one of comics' most infamous creatures of the night and the star of many of my wildest sexual fantasies, Morbius the Living Vampire. Oh boy, just imagine what those palm suckers can do. Thomas gets the job done with his beat-for-beat -beat adaptation of the movie, but as a somewhat truncated retelling of the novel, the narrative often feels rushed. That being said, where this comic book really shines is as a showcase for some of Mike Mignola's most striking and spine-tingling artwork. Mignola was, at the time, best known as the artist behind 1989's Batman Gotham by Gaslight, making him a natural fit for a Victorian Gothic setting. But it was his work on Dracula that would mark a turning point in his trademark style, and lay the groundwork for his creator-owned Hellboy. All I really want to do is draw monsters, Mike Mignola once told Christopher Brayshaw of the Comics Journal, and with that modest intention he has carved out a comics career like no other. Dracula is a story of temptation, 
of sensual evil and the conflict between science and the supernatural. These are all themes that can be found in the works of Mike Mignola, for whom the moody atmosphere of Dracula was an early influence. The artist first discovered Stoker's classic horror novel while in sixth grade, and it proved to be a defining moment, as Mignola himself explains. I remember making like a conscious decision when I read Dracula, saying this is it. This, this, is, this is the stuff for me. I don't know what I'd been reading up to that point, but when I read Dracula, I said, I'm done. I'm done thinking about other stuff. I found my thing. It's the atmosphere and the mystery and the... Uh, that idea of a world beyond ours that functions in a way that will never completely understand it. But it's perfect. It just clicked. Just as Bram Stoker's Dracula fuses folklore with real-world history and geography to mythologize Vlad the Impaler and the Ottoman invasion of Wallachia, Mignola references more recent history by incorporating World War II-era Nazis into Hellboy's Tales of the Occult. Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula is notable for its use of period-correct visual effects, eschewing the newly emerging CGI technology of the time in favor of in-camera and on-set techniques, such as lighting, makeup, and matte paintings. As Coppola explained at the time, we tried to be more in the tradition of cinema in 1897, which was the era in which magicians first brought motion pictures to the world. The early science fiction films of illusionist Georges Méliès, as well as Jean Cocteau's La Belle et la Bête, and F. W. Murnau's Nosferatu informed the cinematic stylings of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and these visual cues bleed directly onto Mike Mignola's pages. For example, the shadow of the Count looming over Lucy Westenra in a way that homages Nosferatu even more overtly than the movie. Mignola's bold, minimalistic style suits the Victorian setting. It evokes newsprint of the late 1800s, or in fact the illustrations of a 15th century text in which one might learn the tale of Vlad Dracula and his crusade against the Turks. Blocky, shadowed faces and craggy textures aid the book in feeling antiquated and ornate, something far removed from the style de jour of early 90s comics. This Dracula comic isn't grim and gritty or extreme, but it is dark and it induces an inescapable sense of dread. Darkness defines Mike Mignola's style, the stark contrast between heavy black inks and his bold use of negative space. The war between light and dark, life and death, rages on in every page of this comic. And for the reader, it's all too easy to give oneself over to the allure of the shadows. Mignola draws the Count himself not as the urbane Gary Oldman, but as this mustachioed Rasputin-type madman. His wild eyes dominate every panel in which he features, and even some that he doesn't. It restores some of the mystique that I feel is lost in Oldman's bare-all performance. This Dracula is undoubtedly more sinister, more enigmatic, and much, much scarier. The visual effects and overall aesthetic are the star attractions of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, but the comic is even more stylized, even more graphic, and even more colorful. Speaking of which, special mention must be made of colorist Mark Chiarello, who would continue to work with Mignola on the first Hellboy series. Chiarello colors Mignola's work in what would become the latter's trademark style, using flat colors for a traditional look, but making use of digital coloring's wider range of hues. In Dracula, he clashes blood reds and sickly greens to create a tummy turning tableau of terror. While the movie is, I feel, a mixed bag of gothic horror cliches and questionable performances, the comic book adaptation is a timeless and effortlessly cool depiction of the Dracula mythos. It stands on its own as a defining moment in the career of one of comics' most unique and celebrated artists. It's in the pages of this book that we see the fruition of all of Mike Mignola's comic book and horror influences, and it sets the stage for what will come next with Hellboy. Bram Stoker's Dracula the comic book is a worthy addition to the canon of Dracula adaptations, and I dare say one of the best movie tying comics of all time. One truly horrifying moment. Thanks for watching this video. <laughs> if you want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash panels to pixels. A special thank you to Carlos Fontes, who is the latest rad dude to sign up at the maximum carnage level. Thanks Carlos, you rock! If you're new here, why not drop a like and subscribe to Panels to Pixels so you never miss out on future videos. If you want to see more stuff like this, you can check out the video I did last Halloween called The Body Horror of Superheroes. It's a good one, trust me. You can also click below that video for the full One Horrifying Moment playlist. 
Thanks to Matt Draper for setting all of this up. What a bloody legend, eh? Happy Halloween, everybody. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.